Imagine you just moved to Florida to pursue the career of your dreams. You fall in love and you're planning to get married. Everything is great until one terrifying night when you're woken up by a familiar figure looming over you and saying these words, do you wanna live or die? Hi everyone, welcome back. This is our fifth episode in the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and this is my co-host, boyfriend, and best friend, lover, Jonathan. Hi. And we're so glad you're here for yet another episode. And thank you all for the feedback we've been getting. It's really awesome to hear your thoughts. And don't forget to subscribe. And click the notification bell so you uh -huh. don't miss out on one of our uploads. Dark Livity is the dark downward slope into the depravity of the human mind and the consequences such darkness brings to light. So someone commented that I was pronouncing depravity wrong. And here's the thing. In law school, we learned about the depraved heart murder and it's pronounced depraved. It means morally corrupt or wicked and depravity is the same thing. It's wicked or morally corrupt. And essentially, it's the same exact word. But the damn English language, you got tomato, tomato. Potato, potato. I personally like depravity because I think it sounds better. But since I don't want people to think I don't know how to pronounce words, I will say it correctly. But when I do, just know that I'm thinking of a depraved heart and mind. And I might even change the definition of dark liberty that I made up for this podcast. It's completely made up word. And I might change the made up definition for that reason. Stay tuned. This case is a super unique case. If you're familiar with the style we usually use to tell these horrific stories, you probably know that we prefer to dive really deep into the individual's personal lives and tell the whole story up to the investigation and then the trial. But in this case, the trials where everything was uncovered the evidence, the court documents, the testimony under oath. So this case was all over the Fort Lauderdale News back in April of this year. And if you're new to me, I was born in Fort Lauderdale, so I'm drawn to a lot of Florida stories for that reason. And I just know you're going to have a lot to say about this one. A lot of opinions and mixed emotions, to say the least, because I know we do. Yes, this case is wild. And there are also hours and hours of footage. And of course, we won't be showing you all of that. But unlike other cases where we never really get to examine the evidence for ourselves, we have a lot of it. So we will be able to show you that. And if you are not watching and only listening, don't worry. There is good audio on these clips. And we will show you what we can. And if we can't show it to you, we will describe everything the best we can. Now, there will be several people that you'll need to be at least slightly familiar with in this story. And three of them are roommates. And those are the most important players. So here goes. First, we will introduce you to Nicholas John Wilcox. He was born on January 15th of 1978 at Day Kimball Hospital in Putnam, Connecticut. His parents, Vicki J. Wilcox and Donald E. Wilcox Jr. and his brother, Donald E. Wilcox III, were thrilled to have another kid running around the house. Don was only four when Nick was born, so he was so excited to have a little brother to play sports with. When Nick was still very young, the family moved to Norwich, Connecticut, a city 40 minutes south of Putnam, and I have to say, it is the cutest town. They have all the New England-style buildings overlooking the river and this huge courthouse with a clock tower in the middle of the city. It looks like it would be so nice living there, and I'd like to visit at least once. Yeah, me too. Well, Nick grew up in Norwich, Connecticut, and went to Ledyard High School, about a 10-minute drive south, where he played football. He was known by his friends, family, and teammates to be an energetic and enthusiastic player. After he graduated in 1996, he went on to join the construction industry, following a long tradition in his family. His grandfather, Donald E. Wilcox Sr., was a fisherman and constructed boats. His dad was also in construction, and his brother Don was a contractor. Nick was naturally gifted at roofing, and he worked various jobs in the Norwich and New London area, building up his clientele. In October of 1996, Nick's brother got married, and Nick wanted a family of his own. He was dating a woman named Katie Ann Martin, who had been in his graduating class. They got married in New London, Connecticut on September 15th, 2001. 
when Nick was 23 years old. And then a year later, they welcomed their first baby boy. And then another three years later, they had two boys, Zachary and Seth, and a daughter, but she isn't 18 yet. So it's important to me to value the family's privacy. So I will not be releasing her name. And I'm also going to fast forward through the circumstances of Nick and Katie's separation. Stuff like that happens. And it's really the family's business what details they want to publish and the family wishes for that to remain close to their heart and not in the public. So I can respect that. Nick was a devoted father and continued to support his family while building his career throughout his 30s. When his older brother Don moved to West Palm Beach, Florida to work as a contractor, it was the perfect opportunity for Nick to move down to Florida and pursue jobs that would have a more lasting impact on the community. When it comes to construction jobs, Florida is a great place to be. There are many construction opportunities in Florida rather than Connecticut. And it really feels like so many people want to move there. They do. I mean, I'm from there, so I guess I might be a little biased, but I think it's a great place to live. But for me, being there so long, I'm actually glad that I'm in California now. Yeah, me too. I do love visiting, but the weather's actually better in California. I know they call it the sunshine state over there, but mm -hmm. it hardly ever rains here. So this is really the sunshine state. Yeah. However, financially, Florida is so much better. Oh, yeah. But Florida is great for construction and a nice place to live because it is sunny all year round except for the thunderstorms in the middle of each day. And of course, the beaches are great. But another reason that it's great for construction is because hurricanes. There will always be a need for weatherproofing homes and repairing buildings. It's also rewarding to be able to clean up after a storm and see how your efforts impact people's lives. 39-year-old Nick Wilcox chose to follow his brother and he had no regrets. Since Nick was still establishing himself in Florida, he moved into an apartment in 2017 while his ex-wife Katie took care of the kids back in Connecticut. He briefly worked as an authorized service provider for Home Depot, but then Nick became a contractor with a company called Synergy Home Care in Plantation, Florida, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. In September of 2017, Hurricane Irma hit Florida, and I don't know if you remember it, but it was a Category 5 hurricane with 180 mile per hour winds. Category 5 is the highest rating on the scale and Florida went into a state of emergency. Almost 7 million people had to evacuate. So Nick had to hurricane-proof hundreds of buildings before the storm and then do repairs after the storm passed. One way to hurricane-proof a home is to board up the windows with plywood. And there was actually a plywood shortage at the time. You couldn't get any in the stores, and that's a big problem when you're faced with an emergency situation. I have been through many hurricanes growing I mean, up I in Florida. Imagine. The generators boarding up the house, no water, no electricity. It's it's a big deal. Yeah. And you guys don't have any basements really, huh? No, we don't have basements. Right? You feel like you would. You don't even really need basements. Yeah, this is your My grandma is used to literally through. tape our windows with masking tape and she thought that that was going to keep them secure. She would like do the, you know, crisscross and then one in the middle and I'm like and you could hear them shaking during the storm, my poor grandma. One woman named Pamela Letts, remembers Nick's kindness. It was Saturday, early afternoon in September, a beautiful sunny day. It was what she described as the calm before the storm, before Hurricane Irma hit. There was a shortage of plywood in all the hardware stores, and there were long lines, which made Pamela concerned because she only had enough plywood to board up the back of her sliding glass door. She was walking her dog and saw a work crew boarding up the windows of a house. Nick was one of those men, and for whatever reason, Pamela saw Nick and thought he seemed approachable. So she went up to him and remembered thinking to herself, what beautiful eyes. Then she told Nick her situation. He told her to check back with me in a couple of hours and I'll see what I can do. But before she could check back, she saw Nick backing his truck into her driveway. He pulled out a sheet of plywood. Then he pulled out seven more, proceeded to offer to board up her windows. Pamela said Nick did not know her when she approached him in that driveway, yet he took the time to generously assist her and her family without asking for anything in return. It just shows that Nick is a very kind person who would go out of his way to help people, especially in desperate times. He was generous and treated everyone like they were family, no matter what was happening in his personal life. And speaking of his personal life, Nick had a lot going on at home from June to September of 2017. He was living at 7201 Northwest 15th Street in Plantation. Now, if you are from Florida or have been there, you know Plantation isn't exactly a prime location. It's west of Fort Lauderdale, very populated, very built up, residential in nature, but it's not what you would normally think about when you think of Florida. It's inland for once, so it's not close to the beach. And it's actually closer to the Everglades, 
which is a 1.5 million acre wetland preserve in South Florida. It's also known as the River of Grass. It's made up of coastal mangroves, sawgrass marshes, pine flatwoods, and lots of wildlife, especially alligators. Nick had moved into a three bedroom, two bath rental home with two roommates, Eric Robinson and Isabella Taglarini. And those are the next two people that we will be introducing you to. This is a one story house, a little over 3000 square feet and features a nice pool in the backyard. It's actually a duplex. They're popular in Florida, so there's two houses connected, the exact same on both sides, both with three bedrooms and two baths, and they have two separate backyards, two separate addresses, and leases. Eric had been living on one side of the duplex for the past eight years, and he was the only person on that lease, so it was essentially his home. But per usual, rent prices were going up, and he needed someone or some people to help out with the bills. So, in July 2016, he invited Isabella to move in with him. They had an on-again and off-again relationship, and this time they were on and living under the same roof. Eric and Isabella slept together in the primary bedroom until they officially broke up in June of 2017. That is around the time Nick moved into one of Eric's spare bedrooms. By this time, Eric and Isabella were already sleeping in separate bedrooms and doing the whole breakup thing. And I would have to imagine that there was some very awkward tension during this time. Of course. I've had some weird roommate situations but I've never lived with an ex for longer than maybe a week, if that. If any of you have, let me know. I like reading your stories in the comments. But Nick considered both Isabella and Eric to not only be his roommates, but also his friends. Eric and Nick were already friends before Nick moved in, but once he did, he became friends with Isabella as well. He liked the couple a lot, and they got along really well. That's why it's so important to tell you more about their lives. Isabella was born in Brazil in 1979, making her 38 years old at the time, only a year younger than Nick. She lived in Sao Paulo with her kids and worked at Azul Brazilian Airlines. In 2010, she moved to the U.S. and married an American man named Nicholas Taglarini. It's another Nicholas, and he's the fourth person you're going to have to be aware of from here on out. We will refer to him as Nicholas, and Nick Wilcox, who you already know a lot about at this point, is just Nick. When Isabella moved to the U.S., her kids remained in Brazil, and Isabella and her new American husband, Nicholas, lived together in Fort Lauderdale until they separated in 2016. But soon after she was married to Nicholas, Isabella was able to obtain a green card. And when she subsequently divorced, she was going through the immigration process, hoping to become a permanent citizen of the United States. The same year she broke up with Nicholas was the same year that Isabella started dating Eric Robinson. Now let's get into what he is all about. Eric was born in 1971 in Worcester, Massachusetts, making him 46. And I had to be extra careful. I just learned how to pronounce it to make sure I was pronouncing that correctly because my father actually grew up in Massachusetts and he would be quite ashamed if I didn't know how to say these words. So I hope I got it right or at least did a you pretty did. good job. Forgive me on pronunciations. I do try. Did great. So let's go back to Eric. He was a bachelor before meeting Isabella. He hadn't been married or had kids yet, but he was still friends with his ex-fiancee named Meredith Kensick. Together, they shared custody over their dogs after the breakup. Eric had been with Meredith for five and a half years from 2010 to 2016. So they were together for about the same amount of time as Isabella and her ex-husband Nicholas. It was a coincidence, but also something that the two had in common. And you know how those things can connect people. They can. It's like, oh, it's a coincidence. We both were in a relationship for five and a half years, and we broke up at the same time. Mm. Anyway, Meredith felt like Eric had a polarizing personality, as in there were two different sides to him. Depending on who you were and what the circumstances were, he could either be super friendly or he could be a bit aggressive. So let's go back to when the three of them, Eric, Nick, and Isabella, became roommates. Only two and a half months after Nick moved in, Eric was charged with cocaine possession. And by the way, which could be the reason Eric had such a polarizing personality. True, because maybe he, that wasn't his real personality. Uh -huh. Just like him intoxicated sure. under the influence. Yeah. And if you don't know cocaine, it can turn you into an entirely different person. It can be extremely addictive and it can cause agitation, irritability, overconfidence, incessant talking, and becoming restless, which can really affect the people around you. Yes, it can. And that's why they probably looked at him like that. But in Florida, cocaine is actually a Schedule II controlled substance and possession of cocaine is a third-degree felony punishable by up to five years in prison and five years of probation, a $5,000 fine, and two years of driver's license suspension. But what amount are we talking about, you might wonder? What's enough for you to go to jail? Well, possession of less than 28 grams of cocaine is considered a third-degree felony, 
and possession of over 28 grams is considered trafficking. Trafficking in cocaine includes knowingly selling, purchasing, delivering, manufacturing, and possessing the substance. So I looked because I was curious, as I always am, and according to Google, this is what about one gram looks like. So who knows how much Eric had on him, but it wasn't over 28 grams, and I don't know how much Nick or any of the other people in Eric's life knew about him having cocaine in the house or in his possession. But Eric did go to jail on August 23rd, 2017, and Nick and Isabella had no clue when he was going to be back. That caused an issue because remember Eric was already having trouble paying the rent before he got two roommates? Now he's gone, leaving Nick and Isabella to pick up the slack and pay his share of the rent. They couldn't risk losing the roof over their head, especially with the hurricanes and everything else that was going on. So they threw themselves into work. With Hurricane Irma on its way, Nick spent his days hurricane proofing and doing construction on houses in Palm Beach County, which is where I actually went to college and where my father lived. I've spent a lot of time hunkering down during the hurricanes. Well, because Isabella was out of work and Nick was super busy, he enlisted her help. He eventually became her boss. He'd pay her to sweep and clean up after his projects. They made a decent team. Now he could focus on doing more projects and not cleaning up after himself. It made him more efficient in using his time wisely. He valued Isabella's help and also her company. After all, they were together all the time. They'd go to work, go home, eat dinner, watch TV, go to sleep, and then do it all over again. And Isabella was gorgeous, and Nick was pretty handsome. It made sense that there would be some attraction there. Plus, they were both single, so I think you can guess where their relationship was mm -hmm. heading. Nick was a romantic, and he's definitely catching feelings for Isabella. So I'm not trying to be funny, but I don't know if you've ever heard of the U-Haul syndrome. No. As in the U-Haul truck Never. company? Okay. This is when people move in too quickly with someone right after they meet because either they have a fear of being alone or they're so caught up in the honeymoon phase that they make rash decisions. But these U-Haul relationships, as I referred to, are usually the crash and burn kind. They're very intense in the beginning, but then they fizzle out when reality sets in. And I'd kind of compare Isabella and Nick to that, except they were already roommates However, it hadn't been that long since Isabella had broken it off with Eric. This isn't uncommon for roommates to fall for each other. I did a similar case on my main channel, and it didn't end well. And I can see that because Isabella and Nick, they were forced to go be a team together. And exactly. it seemed to be working out. And they're attractive, like you said, and the chemistry could have possibly been there. Yeah. They're helping each other in hard times, and I could see how the attraction would build. Sure. As for Nick and Isabella, they were definitely in that intense honeymoon phase because on September 3rd, just 10 days after Eric went to jail, they wrote a love letter together. It wasn't just a love letter, it was a commitment letter. Even more, it was an intention letter. Wow. Almost like a contract. It was in Nick's handwriting and the document stated Nick's intent to actually get married to Isabella and have kids with her. Wow. It's, it reminds me of kids in love in high school. They even pricked both of their fingers and pressed their fingerprints into the document, signing it in blood. I swear that infatuation drives people to do the wildest things sometimes, but for Nick and Isabella, this was a whirlwind romance. They even started to share the same bed in the primary bedroom where Isabella and Eric used to sleep together. And Isabella used a piece of tape to hang the love letter over her side of the bed. Wow. I was going to say that you and I definitely had very intense feelings. We still do. Still for one do. Another, but especially when we first got together because we had been friends for so long. Yeah. Like almost three years. So it was just like, oh, we finally get to... Hold hands. <laughs> we finally... We were cute when we first held yeah. hands. But we also moved in together the first week we started dating. Right. We did. <laughs> Are we a U-Haul no. relationship? No. We're going to haul this relationship to the grave. Exactly. I think sometimes you just know, and especially when you're older, because we're talking about Isabella and Nick being 38 and 39 years old. Yeah, and it seemed like they both knew what they wanted, and that maybe fate said they'd be friends first and put into this roommate situation for this to happen. Right. But things were getting pretty serious, and they began calling each other girlfriend and boyfriend, and then fiancé, even though Nick didn't officially propose. But just because they were seemingly in love, it doesn't mean that they had a perfect relationship. I mean, who does, right? Right. I mean, nobody has a perfect relationship. They had their disagreements, and they wouldn't always see eye to eye. 
After all, they are from entirely different cultures and backgrounds. For one thing, they've both been married, then divorced, and have kids of their own. So that's a lot to think about. It is. That's almost like a lot of baggage coming into a relationship. Sure. And on September 22nd, they got into a disagreement that caused Isabella to leave the house. She stayed in a hotel overnight. By the next day, they both had cooled down, and she came back home to talk it through with Nick. They'd made up after the arguments like they did in the past, and by October, they were stronger than ever. And honestly, sometimes hard times bring people closer together. I know that we've had things that we've had to go through, breakups, disagreements, not breakups with each other, but just like going through breakups before we met, disagreements, just getting to know what makes the other person tick. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, like I said, there's no such thing as a perfect relationship, but having the willingness to listen, to make compromises, and to communicate because we love each other. And people that do should keep the relationship strong by doing that. No, just honesty and the communication is probably the strongest things to have. It is. And I think that respect, as I said in the other video we did, because once it breaks down, it's really hard to repair respect. And I know that people don't put value presidential like presidents don't have as much value as they used to but my grandma used to always tell me she used to say pretend like you're talking to the president when she wanted me to be as respectful as possible and that applies to your partner as well like your boss or someone that you don't want to lose a relationship with because let's say you don't want to lose your, your job i would always think of it as what would i say to my boss would i be like f you no because i don't want to lose my job so I don't want to lose my relationship. So it's the same thought of like, respect that person, give them the utmost respect. It's just like my little caveat. Absolutely. Respect is earned. Sometimes I just feel like being a best friend or a big sister and giving little pieces of advice. But back to the case at hand on Thursday, October 5th, 2017 at 5 o'clock p.m., the Plantation Police Department received a call from Nicholas Taglarini, and that's Isabella's ex-husband. He said they should call his ex-wife because she had wanted to report a crime. Kind of a strange call to get from the police, you think. Why couldn't she just call them herself? Well, exactly. And I'm sure that's a question that a lot of you have as well. And we will get to that. I promise. You're going to understand more soon enough. Nicholas gave the police Isabella's number and they do end up calling her. And when she answered, she sounded like she was shaken up. She was trying to recite her address over the phone to them. And when they arrived on scene, Isabella was hysterically crying. But instead of reporting a crime like her ex-husband said she wanted to do, Isabella denied anything was wrong at all. She just said that her fiancé had left town. But she quickly changed her tune when the officer told her that her ex-husband already told them that she admitted that Nick Wilcox was dead and that she knew where his body was. Wow. Wow. Exactly. Officer Christopher King was the first one on the scene. He pulled up to the house with all the windows boarded up with plywood. Once he got inside, he did a cursory walkthrough. He could tell by the smell of the place that a major cleaning had been done. He specifically said he could smell the distinct scent of fabuloso cleaner and wet paint. As his eyes scanned the room, it was apparent that someone was in the middle of painting the walls in the main bedroom. There was an open paint can on the floor sitting in view through the open door. It didn't take much to figure out a really sloppy cover-up had been attempted. And if you're watching this, and not just listening, you can see the splotchy paint job. It appeared that the walls had been beige color. Now one whole wall was painted white and fresh paint still drying. Another wall had newly painted white splatters and the ceiling also had wet splotches on it. There was also a pillowcase with a large blood stain on it and the pillow inside also had blood droplets. The mattress was completely gone, leaving just a box spring and a bed frame. And all of the furniture had been pushed into the center of the room, so none of it was touching the walls, which makes sense because someone is painting them. Mm -hmm. In that same bedroom, there was a red solo cup on a nightstand with blood spatter on the white part of the rim. There were cleaning supplies in there on the box spring, as well as rubber gloves that appeared to have blood on them, as well as several large bottles of hydrogen peroxide in the living room and even in the bathroom and scattered around the house. The officer found what looked like blood droplets on the counter by the bathroom sink. Out in the back patio of the house, he spotted a wet mop leaning against the wall as though it had been recently used. The officer had a feeling that this had been quite a brutal crime scene. There was also blood found in the pool area of the home and the back gate where it looked like someone had used that gate to exit the backyard, most likely with Nick's body. 
At this point, lead detective Daniel Haynes, as well as Detective Shirkman and other officers of the Plantation Police Department arrived on the scene. They would do a more thorough inspection of the premises later, but right now, they all piled into their cruisers, along with Isabella, in the back of Lieutenant Joseph Cuchilla's patrol car, and she directed them to a shopping district called the Plantation Promenade, between Cleary Boulevard and Knob Hill Road, just about 10 minutes from her home. This is where she said that they could find her deceased fiance in one of the dumpsters in back of the public supermarket. As soon as Isabella said she was sure that this is where Nick's body was, she was transported back to the police station for questioning. Meanwhile, Officer King took a look inside the dumpster and he immediately noticed a gray tarp about six feet long wrapped up with a belt around both ends. He notified the detectives that it looked like he had located the body. At that point, Crime scene technicians, as well as the medical examiner, were called out to the scene. Once in the briefing room, waiting for detectives to speak with her, Isabella made a comment to Lieutenant Cuchilla. She said, quote, Do you think that I will ever be able to forget the sound of someone trying to breathe? End quote. The lieutenant told her to please hang on. A detective would be with her shortly. By this time, the police had already spoken to Isabella's ex-husband, Nicholas Taglarini, about what Isabella told him. He stated that Isabella revealed to him that her ex-boyfriend, Eric Robinson, had broken into the home and murdered her new fiancé while they were sleeping. She wanted to know what she should do. He told her to call the police, but she was too scared. She begged him not to tell anyone, but realizing the seriousness of the situation, he immediately called the Plantation Police Department. He told them his ex-wife said that her current lover's body could be found in a dumpster behind a Publix grocery store, very close to her house. Sounds pretty cut and dry, right? Sure. But as true crime consumers, we know truth is always stranger than fiction, and nothing is ever as it seems. In fact, as the saying goes, there are three sides to every story. One is the objective truth, which is when something's true for everyone, whether they agree with it or not. The other two versions are the subjective truth. It's what a certain individual perceives as the truth in their own perspective. And that's what the quote by Robert Evans says, there's three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. And things in this case are going to get very complicated. We all are going to need to use our brains just like the jury, but we are going to have way more evidence than they were allowed to have because of the strict evidence rules in court. We get to know things they didn't. And some things do not add up. Well, wait, isn't Eric still in jail? Right. That's the thing. Officers don't know anything at this point. And there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered. However, Isabella's statement to her ex-husband was incriminating. Though it seemed like the details over the course of that night were a bit blurred. She explained that she had been up since 2.30 that morning. She was sleep deprived. She was traumatized. But was she telling the truth? Or did Isabella have more of a role than she was letting on? Regardless, at this point, her account of what happened was good enough for them to try to arrest Eric and begin an investigation. Officers Daniel Haynes and Thomas Butt were in charge of tracking him down. They looked up his jail record out in Pompano Beach, Florida, and they found out Eric had been released on Tuesday, October 3rd. So that would mean he was out of jail less than two days before committing a murder, and he was actually pretty easy to find. They began canvassing the area around his home, and they found him driving his Cadillac at 8 p.m., only two miles from his house. Eric immediately said he did not want to talk to them. He was arrested on a suspected murder charge. He was taken to the main jail in the Broward Sheriff's Office and would remain in Fort Lauderdale Sheriff's Prison for the next five years. Five years. Yeah, while the detectives worked to prove whether or not he was guilty. Five years. Wow. As you know, we wouldn't be doing this case if it was that obvious that Eric committed this crime, so to speak. But let us tell you what they knew thus far before we talk about what was uncovered as they dug deeper into all three of these roommates. First, they did recover the deceased body of Nick Wilcox from that public dumpster. He was wrapped in a gray tarp, which was covered with duct tape and had two belts fastened around him to hold it together. After checking that his body was inside, he was transported to the morgue inside the tarp the way that he had been found so that they could preserve any evidence that would be inside. Once he arrived, they needed to notify next of kin and have someone come to identify the body. Nick's brother, Don, who lived in South Florida, was the first to get a call from the police. And sadly, he took on the horrific task of having to view his younger brother in such a gruesome manner. 
but he didn't want his parents to have to see him that way. He confirmed that the body was that of Nicholas Wilcox. After all Don had witnessed, having to look at a loved one in that condition, he was put into the horrible position of telling his parents, Vicky and Donald, that Nick had been murdered. Their father, Donald, answered the phone, and when his older son delivered the news that their youngest son was dead, he was silent. He described it as feeling like he had been hit by a lightning bolt. He thought this had to be a mistake, and he was holding on to the hope that it was. He was just paralyzed in that moment, unable to speak. All he kept thinking was, how will he break the news to his wife? But he knew he had to, and when he did, they just sat there, together, embracing one another, crying. Not too long after that call, on the same night, the Connecticut Police Department chaplain came to their house and confirmed that Nick was dead and had been killed. The delivery of those words brought them to their knees. This took away all hope that there was a mistake. They just couldn't believe that Nick's three children would be without their father forever. It was unbearable. I can never imagine what it's like for a parent to get that news. No. And I'm going to read you their own words about what it was like to receive the news from their home in Connecticut. They said, quote, That awful night when we received the call that Nick was gone was the most horrific news that we've ever received. It is beyond words to explain the feeling that runs through your mind and body. You become paralyzed by the pain that explodes from within you, a pain that there's no cure for, and the pain that will remain within you forever. At first, there's denial. You tell yourself, there must be a mistake. But eventually, you face the truth that your son is gone and there's nothing you can do. Then the blanket of guilt comes over you. What if I had done this? What if I had done that? looking for answers that would have prevented this tragic death, but there is none. End quote. Those were the words of Donald and Vicki Wilcox. They just had to say goodbye to their youngest son who had just moved states away not too long ago, and now he's dead. And that pain was never ending. It only got worse. They had to tell their grandchildren that their father was dead, and they described their grief as soul-crushing. Nick's two older children, Zachary and Seth, said that their sudden loss was as if the entire world had stopped spinning, leaving a hole that will never be filled. They said that what happened will never be forgotten, nor will their father, and that they now must learn to forget what hurt and to remember what it has taught them. They believe their dad will live within them every day until they meet again at Heaven's Gate. Those were their words. For several days, the media was silent about Nick's identity so all of his immediate family members could be notified and they could start to process what happened. Don was also so devastated, but he didn't want his parents to witness what he did. So he had to stay strong for the family. He took control of Nick's estate and arranged his cremation and funeral back in Connecticut. The family did everything in their power to celebrate the hardworking, selfless man they loved so much and to seek justice for his murder. But before Nick was released to his family, an autopsy was conducted by Dr. Stephen Robinson, the deputy chief medical examiner for Broward County. Nick was bludgeoned and stabbed, and it was obvious that the manner of death was homicide, and the cause of death was blunt force trauma to his head and stab wounds to the neck. When I heard how badly Nick was injured, it was pretty unbelievable to me. Just the sheer brutality and the force that was necessary to carry out such intense injuries. It had to be immense. There were six different wounds to Nick's head and scalp, and they had been caused by a blunt object without an edge, which caused a fatal injury to his brain. There were also six additional stab wounds to his neck and seven more cutting wounds to his throat. His teeth had been knocked out during the attack, and they had actually gone down his throat, and he was choking on them as they were lodged in his airway when he was struggling to breathe. And we're going to get to that part later because there was a witness. Nick also suffered from a broken jaw, and most of the bones in his face were broken. His face was essentially smashed in. Many of the stab wounds were plunged several inches into his neck area. Other wounds were cutting wounds, where it looked like the killer had tried to actually cut Nick's throat, but instead would stop and then create these penetrating stab wounds that even tore into one of his earlobes. And I wish that was all, but it's not. There were also stab wounds to Nick's upper chest, which included a grouping of wounds to his neck and that upper chest area. And I'm so sorry that I had to go into that much detail, but I also think it's important to know what these evil human beings are capable of doing to someone. That is the whole depravity that we're referring to in these cases. And now when I say that there was a witness, I was talking about Isabella. Isabella. Exactly. 
the woman who was in love with Nick, the one who had signed a love letter in blood just a month earlier. Now she was sitting in a police station with investigators telling her truth. But remember what I said, there are different truths and she was subjectively telling her truth. You'll need to wait until the end to hear everything before making an opinion about what you think happened. Remember, Isabella already lied to the officers saying that Nick was out of town, but they called her out on that lie. In fact, she was interviewed three separate times over the course of that night, with her story changing each time. During her first statement, she minimized her involvement and blatantly lied about the entire series of events. She was interviewed a second and third time that night by lead detective Daniel Haynes. It was late when Haynes arrived at the station to interview Isabella under oath. She was not under arrest, but he did swear her in, and she swore to tell the truth. However, she didn't. But at that time, her investigation had just started, so Haynes wasn't aware of all the facts that would come into play later. That's right, she did lie before. Isabella's story was that she thought that Eric was in jail like John said, and after all, he had been gone for almost two months at that point. She referred to Eric as her ex-boyfriend and explained that he broke into her home through the back door at around two o'clock in the morning, in the early morning hours of Thursday, October 5th. Isabella was asleep with her current fiance, as she referred to Nick, when all of a sudden, she was woken up to Eric on top of her with one gloved hand over her mouth and another around her throat threatening her not to scream and asking if she wanted to live or die. She said that Eric was blocking her view so she could not see Nick, but she could hear him gasping for breath and she assumed that he had been gagged. But she said that Eric grabbed her off the bed, threw her outside the room and then went back inside that bedroom with a curved metal rod and she could hear him beating Nick over and over again. Then Eric grabbed some tarps and wrapped up the body and then threw it into the dumpster. Isabella told Detective Haynes that she was terrified of what Eric may do to her, and that is why she didn't call the cops. That and Eric took away her cell phone, and she was tied up, according to her. So for the next 10 hours, in a state of shock, Isabella said that she did whatever Eric told her. He said to pretend that Nick had left town, and to solidify the ruse, Eric used Nick's cell phone to send out text messages making it look like he left. When Isabella finally got the chance to be alone, she said she called her ex-husband not knowing what to do. And we will learn a lot more about all this. But at the time, Isabella was seen as an innocent witness, especially when Eric Robinson's records were pulled up. Remember his arrest in August? Well, it was initiated by a 911 call. Records show that Eric had beaten Isabella with brass knuckles. According to an arrest report, the couple got into an argument and Eric put on brass knuckles and punched Isabella throughout her entire body. When plantation police showed up, Isabella had severe bruisings to her face, neck, arms, shoulders, and her hands. Police said Isabella told them that Eric choked her until she passed out. She said she awoke to him punching her all over her body. Isabella also claimed Eric threatened to kill her and threw her on the floor when he couldn't find his keys. He then threw her against the wall and slapped her over and over again. This apparently led to Eric's arrest and they found him in possession of cocaine at that time, which increased his charges. There was also a restraining order filed at that time against Eric. He was not allowed to contact Isabella, be on the premises, or anywhere near her. Isabella also showed police a video on her phone that she took in early August, the same month where Eric is holding his hand over her mouth, telling her to shut up or he will kill both her and Nick. It would seem that Eric is a very violent person, and police had no reason not to believe what Isabella told them about Nick's murder. She was the victim as well, so she was free to go at this point. But Eric Robinson had his version of the truth. He alleged that Isabella killed Nick and then reached out to him in the middle of the night on October 5th in a panic. Despite the restraining order she had against him, she was desperate for Eric's help. She told him that while she was in a blind, drunken, and drug-induced rage, she bludgeoned Nick to death after an argument. Then she called Eric, begging him to help her clean up the crime scene and dispose of the body. Eric said that he risked everything and helped her because he was still in love with her, and she promised to reconcile with him in exchange for his help. Mm. Wow. So the investigators weren't sure what to believe because they hadn't looked into Isabella yet, but sure enough, they found out she too had a violent streak. Remember how on September 22nd, Isabella and Nick got into that argument and she stayed at a hotel overnight? Yeah. Well, there was way more to that story. 
Nick actually called 911 on Isabella, and Officer Salerno went out to the scene where Nick needed assistance. He claimed his girlfriend was extremely intoxicated on Xanax and alcohol. When the officer got there, he saw that items were smashed in the house, and there had definitely been an argument between the couple. There was damage to Nick's truck. Wow. Isabella had used something to bang dents into the side of it, and Nick told the officer that he was frightened of Isabella, and the officer said that he could tell she was very intoxicated and, in his words, quote, belligerent and uncooperative, end quote. So he actually demanded that Isabella leave for the night to cool down, and that's what she did. Nick actually changed the locks on the front door because he wanted to keep Isabella out. Isabella was known to have a temper. She was described as extremely jealous and quick to anger. People who knew her said she could easily fly into a rage, and she was also known to become violent. As investigators dug into this, they reached out to her ex-husband, who confirmed this information. Mm -hmm. Isabella told him all about this incident between her and Nick because she was concerned it would interfere with her immigration status. Right. According to him, Nick Wilcox had allegedly told Isabella that he would have her deported if she didn't pay for the damages that she had done to his work truck. Wow. It's interesting how it's completely different once you dig into it. But the two had seemingly worked out their differences and were back together, as evidenced by the fact that they were sleeping together in the same bedroom where Nick was killed in the early morning hours of October 5th. Detectives began interviewing dozens of people who knew Nick, Eric, and Isabella to get more information about what happened. On October 6th, a neighbor named Christina Ginsberg, who lived across the street from Eric's at 7165 Northwest 15th Street, made a statement to the police. So I want to try to give you a visual of this so it's easy for you to understand if you're not watching. So let's say I am standing on a street and I'm looking north. Eric's house would be on the west side of that street and Christina's house would be on the east side of that street. And you can see here that the sides of their homes face each other. Christina said her side of the house faced Eric's side and she could see his yard from her window. Eric's backyard was surrounded by a fence. She knew that Eric and Isabella lived there and kind of knew of Nick. She said she'd seen him come and go from time to time but wasn't sure if he lived there, but she knew what vehicle he drove, the pickup truck, and she knew Eric drove the dark colored Cadillac. Christina said it was early in the morning of October 5th, maybe around 4 a.m., when her daughter started crying. Christina went into the room to care for her daughter when she did, she heard a loud bang coming from outside, from the direction of Eric's backyard. When she looked out the window, she saw Nick's truck being backed up to the gate of Eric's backyard. The bang might have been from the truck actually banging into the gate because it was flush up against it. She was surprised by the time of night this was happening, but even more surprised when she saw Eric putting stuff into the bed of the truck, including trash bags. She thought both was odd, the time of night and Eric using Nick's truck. She'd never seen him using it before. But she just figured maybe Nick let Eric borrow it to move something. After she was done with her daughter, Christina decided to go back to bed, and then sometime later she heard the sound of an engine running loudly in the distance, and then the sound of the vehicle speeding off. Detectives also tracked down Eric's ex fiance Meredith Kensick, and she lets them know that she was the one who actually picked Eric up from jail on Tuesday, October 3rd, when he was released. She said it was in the afternoon and on their way back to her apartment where she agreed to let Eric stay until he could figure out what he was going to do next. They drove past his place to see if his car was still in the driveway where he left it. He confirmed that it was, and they continued along to Meredith's apartment, which was about a five or 10 minute drive away also in plantation. Later that evening, Meredith drove Eric back over to his place and dropped him off. He came back over to her place a little later driving his Cadillac and he also brought garbage bags full of his clothes and belongings. Eric stayed the night and slept in the living room couch. The next day on Wednesday, Meredith went to work. She didn't know what Eric did the whole day, but when she got home, he was at her place. Now, in the middle of that night, so now we're into Thursday, early morning hours, after Meredith and Eric both went to bed, him on the couch and her in the bedroom, she woke up around 3.45 a.m. and noticed the TV was on, and kind of loud. She got up to check on Eric, but he wasn't sleeping on the couch, so she checked the balcony, and he wasn't there. But that's when she noticed her car was missing from her parking spot, her red Kia. She went to see if her keys were still inside, and they weren't. She figured Eric took her car without asking, and in all the years that they had been together in the past as a couple, he had never taken it without asking. 
She knew he had his own car that night, and it was working just fine. She didn't know why he'd take hers, especially without permission. So she texted him and asked him where the car was, and why he took the car without asking. Well, she didn't get a response, because his phone was actually left behind in the living room. So she went back to bed, and then, a little after 5am, she heard her front door open. She got up to confront Eric. She asked him where he had gone. He said he went to the gas station for some drinks, but he wasn't holding any drinks or anything else in his hands for that matter. The detectives asked her what Eric was wearing and whether he looked like he had blood on him. She said he was wearing black pants with pockets and a tank top and that she didn't see any blood on him. She said he was acting pretty normal, so she went back to bed for an hour or so and got up to go to work. She has no idea what he did after that. Investigators were diligently looking at all the evidence, pulling up CCTV footage from the alleyway behind Publix and searching both Nick and Eric's vehicles, as well as the crime scene and beyond. By October 11th, Detective Haynes called Isabella back into the station for another interview. This time, he was armed with actual evidence that could poke holes in her original story, and that's what he did. Even though Isabella was not under arrest, Detective Haynes did read her her Miranda warnings along with swearing her in. She was told that anything she said could be used against her in a court of law. He did this because he knew there were inconsistencies in her previous statements, and he was going to confront her about them. When searching through Nick's truck and the house, receipts were found from Big Lots and Home Depot, as well as a public landfill where you can pay a fee to deposit trash. The investigators pulled footage from all of those locations, as well as a Publix where Nick's body was found, and what they see calls Isabella's claims into question. Hmm. For one thing, she doesn't seem scared. On these videos, she wasn't afraid or like running, and she wasn't tied up or held against her will. On the contrary, Isabella was all alone at Publix, just walking calmly down the aisles with her phone, looking at items. Wow. We're going to play that footage for you now. The date is October 5th. The time is around 8.25 a.m. when we first spot Isabella. Let's zoom into that frame. Here we go. She's got her purse on her right shoulder. Her hair is down. She's pushing the cart and it seems like an ordinary day. She's walking calmly and then stops to look at some items. It's like her fiance didn't just get bludgeoned to death hours earlier. No kidding. She doesn't look distraught. She's not curled up in a ball crying, and she's certainly not calling for help. Though it can be argued, she had a chance. There were employees there, phones she could use, people that she could tell that she's in danger if she truly felt like she was. Now, a few minutes later at 8.31, we can see Isabella come out of that aisle on the small video to the right. Let's blow that up now. Look, what's that in her left hand? It's her phone, and it's lit up. She's talking to someone from across the store and pointing down the aisle that she just came from. Then look who comes into frame. That's Eric Robinson with his phone in his hand. We don't have audio, but it sure looks like he was asking her where she was, and she's explaining, I was just down this aisle. He doesn't look happy, but she doesn't look extremely scared either. Then it looks like Eric is showing her something on his phone. And this is quite shocking. Isabella moves forward and hugs him. Mm. She hugs him at a time like this. She's giving the supposed killer of the man that she's in love with a hug. It's all too much for the detective. So of course he has questions. Was Eric telling the truth? Was Isabella grateful to him? For helping her? The couple left Publix at 8.33 a.m. hand in hand without buying a thing. Next stop, Big Lots at 9.01. Isabella and Eric walk in together. She had originally told detectives that she was tied up without her phone while Eric went to dump Nick's body. But according to these videos, that's not the case. Eight minutes later, they are in the checkout line and you can see Eric placing four big bottles of peroxide on the counter, along with a paint tray, paint rollers, painter's tape, and a spray bottle. And then it seems like Eric is texting, possibly to Isabella. I mean, she's been gone a couple minutes, right? Do you think she ran to call the police? No. no. Definitely not. She comes back with some sponges. Wow, she comes back with sponges. <sighs> Eric looks at those sponges and chooses the one that he wants to buy. He then pays for everything in cash, and at no time does Isabella alert anyone that she's in danger. It appears that they're purchasing items to clean up a crime scene. Yeah, 100%. Those were the exact items that were found later in that home. 
they left the store together around 9, 10 a.m. It would appear that Isabella has a lot more explaining to do. Exactly. And Detective Haynes is not done yet. They found one more video from a local landfill. It's from around 10 o'clock in the morning that same day on October 5th. Now, Eric is driving Nick's dark silver F-150 pickup truck, and Isabella is calmly sitting shotgun next to him as they pull up to check in at this dump. In the clip, you can see black garbage bags inside the back, but if you look closely, you can kind of see a light part underneath. That's actually a grayish silver tarp, the one that Nick's body was found in, presumably with Nick still inside, along with a few black garbage bags on top, and that is so eerie to me mm -hmm. that I am looking at that right now. You pay by the pound at the landfill, so you're weighed when you come in, and then you're weighed on a scale weigh station when you come out. And about 30 minutes later, Eric gets weighed and only pays $10 for dumping less than 100 pounds of garbage. Nick weighed way more than that. And when you see the clip of the back of the truck right here, I got the chills when I saw this. The black garbage bags are gone, but the gray tarp remains. Nick's body was in the back of that truck. And Eric is just smiling and he's driving around with a dead body in the back of a dead man's truck. And Isabella is by his side. When Isabella is shown all of this footage, her story changes again. She claimed this was all out of self-preservation. She was traumatized. She said that morning, Eric made her take four Xanax bars and drink vodka so that she would be under his control. She says now she remembered that she did have her phone but she was still so scared of what Eric may do. He threatened to kill her kids back in Brazil if she didn't go along with this plan. It does sound kind of convoluted. Like, oh, absolutely. I can see why detectives didn't know what story to believe. Right. And Detective Haynes wanted to seize Isabella's phone. They have the reason to believe that the data on the phone could be very telling. That phone could provide them with a clear picture of what happened that day. At first, Isabella seemed okay with handing it over, but later, when they tried to open the phone, the passcode that she gave them didn't work. It would open with her fingerprint using Touch ID when she was next to them, but once they had it in their possession alone, they couldn't access the contents. So they had to request a data dump for forensic analysis. They also seized Eric's phone when he was arrested, and over the next few days, they thoroughly searched the crime scene for fingerprints and DNA evidence. And all of that was sent to be analyzed. They collected fingerprint sheets from both Eric and Isabella. They went through all of the police reports and burned dozens of CDs full of evidence. Now burned, in case you don't know, I know most of you do, but it's another word for uploaded information to CDs. I know flash drives are more of the norm these days. It kind of makes me feel old. But they used CDs and included the 16-page autopsy report, the 911 calls, vehicle registrations, all of the CCTV footage, as well as proof of the search warrants they obtained for Meredith's apartment, as well as pictures of the crime scene, pictures of the evidence in the dumpster, pictures of handwritten notes that were found. They had cell phone screenshots and cell tower data, as well as recorded statements from Isabella's ex-husband, Meredith, and Isabella. There were nine CDs full of just interviews and CCTV footage of Isabella. Police also looked into Eric Robinson's criminal history, and he had caught a laundry list of charges. Oh, and I actually learned that one in four people who go to jail are arrested within the same year. I thought that was interesting, but I'm That's not surprised. That's a big problem with our criminal justice system. There seems to be a lack of resources to actually rehabilitate people, but it also shows that some people like Eric, who are repeat offenders, don't learn their lessons, and a lot of them need to be locked up for a lot longer. Going back to Eric's record, he was first arrested in July 2001 on multiple charges, including sale and distribution of cocaine, and went to jail until May 2008. Then he was arrested in 2011 for coke possession again. He was pretty much a drug dealer, I'm thinking. For sure. Like, I was thinking, what kind of job does Eric do? I'm assuming, I'm assuming from the facts. He's a pharmacist. He is. Then aggravated battery on Isabella in August of 2016. And then another domestic altercation, including strangulation in June of 2017. And of course, the third charge of cocaine possession in 2017, when he and Isabella got into another fight. And he was arrested before Nick was killed. 
One of Eric's neighbors said they had to call the cops and report him multiple times when he was seen beating up Isabella in the driveway. People in his neighborhood were afraid of him. They always kept their distance on purpose. Wow, that's scary. Like, I can't even think of a neighbor who I think that about. Right. But yeah. if I did, I mean, that's a lot of evidence. Yeah. I'm not sure how much Nick knew about Eric's dark history, but from the nature of Nick's wounds and Eric's history of violence, it was looking pretty clear that Eric killed Nick. And it looked like Isabella had been at Eric's side the entire time, both during the crime and then afterward, fully knowing that he was a danger to people around him. When checking both Eric and Isabella's phones, detectives found no communication between their phones from the time Eric went to jail to the time after Nick was murdered. Mm. However, there were incriminating texts and Facebook messages from Isabella to Eric after the murder. The two of them actually talked about where to dispose of Nick's remains, which is just disgusting that they would be having this conversation, and their plans to lie about him leaving town, as well as cleaning up the crime scene. So once again, Detective Haynes called Isabella back in for questioning on October 14th, and like before, he swore her in and read her Miranda warning, knowing that once again, he had evidence that contradicted her previous statements. When confronted with all this evidence, Isabella admitted that though she never touched Nick's body, she was forced to help Eric clean up the crime scene because she was scared of him. Despite Isabella's repeated lies to authorities, the investigators determined that Eric was responsible for Nick's gruesome fatal beating. However, they also determined that Isabella was an accessory after the fact, which is when someone helps someone else after they commit a felony. And in this case, that felony was determined to be murder in the second degree. Now, I did graduate from law school in Florida, so I do know the laws there pretty well, unlike some of the other states. And second degree murder is a killing of another person without premeditation. And that premeditation is what is required for first degree murder. To prove second degree murder, a prosecutor must show that the defendant acted according to a depraved mind without regard for human life. There's that word again depraved mind or depraved heart murder, which is exactly what I learned in criminal law and why I pronounce depravity as depravity. Makes sense to me. A depraved mind is conduct demonstrating an indifference to the life of another. They couldn't find evidence that Eric actually planned to kill Nick. However, they did find that love letter or marriage contract between Nick and Isabella in Eric's belongings back at Meredith's apartment. So it stands to reason that when Eric stopped by his house, remember it is his house, after being in jail for the last two months and not being allowed to be in contact with Isabella because of that restraining order. And to be fair, he did stop there when he knew that Isabella and Nick wouldn't be there when they were working during the day. He broke in to the back door because he didn't have his keys because Nick changed the locks and he wasn't allowed to contact Isabella. And there was plywood boards all over the windows. This man lived there for eight years. Surely he knew how to break into his own home. And that's when detectives believed he went into his bedroom that he previously shared with Isabella and realized that Nick and Isabella were together because he found the love letter taped to the wall and he saw Nick's things in his room. Now this was the motive. He came back later to see it for himself. And he saw Nick and Isabella in bed together and killed Nick in a rage. In Florida, you can't be charged with accessory after the fact if you're related by blood or marriage to a person who committed the felony. But Isabella and Eric had only dated. And they were scheduled to be tried together as co-defendants. On October 16th, Isabella pleaded not guilty to accessory after the fact. And Eric also pleaded not guilty to the murder. He maintained that he was not responsible for Nick's death, and he hired a private lawyer to represent him. After this, Isabella stayed in jail for four days until October 18th, when she was let out on house arrest until the trial began. But as we explained earlier, there were five years between when Nick's murder was reported and when the trial began. And there are several reasons why this took so long. For one, they had to gather all the evidence and wait for the forensic analysis and DNA reports to come back. Then, Nick's brother Don also filed a wrongful death complaint in 2019, 
He accused the landlord of Eric's home of putting Nick's life in harm's way since they had not done a full background check on Eric or kicked him out after the several arrests. Don sued the landlord, Eric, and Isabella all in one document, but it didn't meet the qualifications for Florida's pleading rules. Don's claim was that if Nick hadn't moved into Eric's place, he wouldn't have been killed. Another delay had to do with Eric's other charges. He had court appointments regarding his probation violation, as well as his private attorney withdrawing in 2020 because Eric couldn't afford to pay the fees. That delayed the trial even longer. Finally, Eric was assigned a public defender named Rachel Newman in February 2020, and she's good. She is really good. I really like her. I know sometimes we don't like defense attorneys, and I understand that, but it is a job. She requested all the information the prosecution had, and at this time, the police were still neck deep in phone records. According to the court documents, they did thousands of pages of phone extractions. Detective Michael Moberg actually found a fake Facebook account that Eric had made and used on the day Nick was murdered. That's crazy, but it's not crazy. Because in our last case, everyone they were can do that. Fake Facebooks, too. Isabella and Eric primarily spoke over Facebook Messenger about Nick's death. These were crucial evidence for the case. However, Rachel realized they had not received a search warrant for the Facebook records, so they needed to wait on that. That takes a long time. Social media records take forever to receive. Then, in March of 2020, COVID hit. So the trial was delayed even further because the lawyers had to gather evidence remotely. Eric's attorney kept having to ask for disks and files, and sometimes she would get them only to find out that they were corrupt. Four disks of Isabella's statements were not even sent to her at all. So the trial was delayed for quite a while until she felt like she had enough evidence to make a compelling argument in favor of Eric not being guilty. Then in 2021, the prosecution realized they needed Isabella to give witness testimony and to incriminate Eric at the trial. So they offered her a plea deal, separating her from being tried with Eric. Isabella would plead guilty to a lesser charge, which is tampering with evidence, and her sentencing for that crime would be deferred until after the outcome of Eric's trial. She would face up to five years in prison. Well, later in December of 2022, Rachel, Eric's attorney, met with Isabella. And she said that Isabella's story did not match up with the story she had told on all of those discs, and she wanted to be with her again. But unfortunately, Isabella had a medical procedure at the time, so they weren't able to meet until 2023. That's why these wow. trials take so long. At that point, since Rachel had so much time to look through this case, she was convinced that Isabella was guilty of killing Nick, not her client. The trial finally began on Monday, April 10th in 2023 in the Broward County Courthouse in Fort Lauderdale. Peter Sapak was the prosecuting attorney, and he argued that Eric was wholly responsible for Nick's murder. The state decided that Isabella was the one telling the truth, I'm doing air quotes, the truth, or most of the truth that they could ascertain from the evidence. Isabella would be their star witness against her former boyfriend, Eric Robinson, as we know, the jury is the final arbiter of the truth in the criminal justice system. Accordingly, what happened next would be for the jury to decide. Eric's first murder trial, and I say that for a reason, bear with us, began and ended abruptly on April 17th, 2023. Yes, the judge declared a mistrial. Because unfortunately, during Eric's ex-fiance Meredith's testimony, she accidentally revealed that Eric had a history of violence against Isabella. She had inadvertently revealed what is known in legal terms as a prior bad act in front of the jury. She told the jury that at the time of Nick's murder, Eric had a restraining order against him to stay away from the house where he previously lived with both Isabella and Nick. I told you that we would know way more than the jury. The jury never got to hear this evidence. And though it seems a little bit unfair, it does. it's for a very good reason. So during the pretrial motions, it's up to the judge to determine the admissibility of certain evidence or the application of specific legal principles. There are certain evidence that would be prejudicial to the defendant because it would unduly influence the jury's decision by appealing to their emotions or their biases. Yeah. So pretrial motions are designed to prevent the introduction of that kind of evidence. And if you watch a lot of trials like I do, you know that the judge must weigh its probative value, so how much can we get from this evidence, over its prejudicial value against the defendant. Often, a conviction can be overturned on a technicality if the judge makes the wrong decision. So for this reason, 
the judge tends to err on the side of caution and exclude prior bad acts. But of course, these judicial rulings are discretionary and they can vary from one case to the other. But I just want to say it's very common not to let in prior bad acts. Right. Unless there is a very, very specific reason why it's going to be allowed and for a limited purpose. And both sides, the defense and the prosecution, get to argue those points outside of the jury's presence and the judge makes that call before the trial starts. So Eric's second trial began a week later on April 24th, 2023, in front of a brand new jury. During opening statements, the jury learned a very limited version of events. They were told that on October 5th, after 5 p.m., Isabella confessed to her ex-husband, Nicholas Taglarini, that her ex-boyfriend, Eric, had broken into her home and attacked her current fiancé, Nick Wilcox, in the middle of the night, then dumped his body in a dumpster at the back of a public supermarket. She told her ex-husband not to tell anyone in fear of what Eric may do, but he called 911 and the police showed up at the home of Isabella and she was in the middle of painting the walls in the primary bedroom. The walls were still wet when the police arrived and despite the hours of cleanup, there was evidence everywhere of something violent occurring. The prosecutor also told the jury that they may not like Isabella and that's okay, they don't have to, but they already checked all the evidence and that evidence led to Eric being the one who brutally murdered Nick. However, he goes on to explain that Isabella appeared to be cooperative but fuzzy on the details due to the trauma of witnessing the man she loved being brutally beaten to death but the jury would soon hear her side of the story for themselves. And during the defense's opening statement, Eric's attorney, Rachel Newman, told the jury to keep an open mind, to really look at the evidence and decide for themselves who was telling the truth. She also reminded the jury that the prosecution had a high bar to overcome. They had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Eric had murdered Nick. The defense doesn't have to prove anything. And Rachel went on to say that it was a case of he said, she said, and in this case, the she had a history of lying, which we know is true. When testimony began, the jury heard from the responding officers, as well as the crime scene technicians, which is where we gathered all of the information we already told you about what the scene looked like, how they found Nick's body. They also heard from the medical examiner, Dr. Stephen Robinson, and we're going to play part of that testimony for you now. In this autopsy of Mr. Wilcox, can you tell us just overall, in general, the injuries that he had? Uh, overall, uh, in injuries uh, to the uh, head and neck. Uh, he had basically essentially two groups of injuries. He had blunt force injuries. Uh, those are injuries caused by an object uh, that's rounded or otherwise does not have a cutting edge to it. Uh, those are predominantly of the head. Um, uh, the lower part of his face and his neck, he had what we call sharp force injuries or incised injuries. And those are injuries caused by an object that has either a cutting edge or some sort of sharp edge to it. And how many blunt force injuries did he have? Uh, he had at least six. And how many sharp force? Um, six stabs, seven cutting, 13 total. The injuries were so brutal that the state concluded Eric's only intention could be to kill Nick. The prosecution argued that Eric hit Nick repeatedly in the head and face with a crowbar, since Isabella described it as a metal rod that was curved on one end. The state argued Eric was in a blind, jealous rage, and he tried to obliterate Nick's face. But this wasn't sufficient to kill Nick, or at least not fast enough for Eric. As you recall, Isabella described to the officer that night when she was first taken into the interview that she would never forget the sound of someone trying to breathe. All the while, she sat there listening to Nick gasping for breath and did nothing to help this man that she swore she loved. She didn't physically intervene, she didn't go to a neighbor, and she didn't call the police. While Nick was choking on his own blood and teeth and was fighting to stay alive, Isabella said she was forced to leave the room only for Eric to go back in and finish the job. I think it's time we heard from Isabella herself. She describes that night for the jury in chilling detail. But first, the jury learned about the living situation at the time and what Isabella's relationship was with these two men. Back in 2017, August of that year, uh, where were you living? I was living in Plantation, 7201. North Street? Yes, okay. perfect. And back in August of that year, who was living at that location? Back in August, yes. uh, it was me, 
Eric and Nicholas Wilcox. Nicholas Wilcox. Mm -hmm. And back on August of 2017, how long were you living there? I moved there in July of 2016. Okay. And you and Eric were boyfriend girlfriend? Yes, we were. Nicholas Wilcox, when did he move into that apartment? In the middle of June of 2017. And uh, were you dating both of them at that, at that point or no? No. Just Eric? Just Eric. Nicholas was a roommate, correct? He was the roommate. How many bedrooms in that apartment or that house? Three bedrooms. Master bedroom? A master bedroom, a bathroom inside, and then two other bed, uh, two other bedrooms, and a bathroom. So Nicholas would have his own bedroom? Yes, of course. And did you share a bedroom with Eric? Yes, we did. Specifically on August of that year, were you sharing a bedroom with Eric? Yes, I was. Now at one point, uh, the defendant went to jail, correct? Yes, he did. Okay. Prior to him going to, to jail, were you still dating him? We were still officially together. So she was still with Eric in August. Yeah, they were not broken they up. They had not been broken up. Right, because before Eric went to jail, Nick was staying in his own room, and both Isabella and Eric were still together. So let's hear what she has to say about that. Prior to the defendant going to jail, were you dating Eric Robinson? Yes. What is your relationship with Nicholas at that point? We were friends. After the defendant, Eric Robinson, went to jail, did you stay in the apartment? Yes, I did. Did Nicholas Wilcox stay in the apartment? Yes, he did. Okay. At any point, did you develop a relationship with Nicholas Wilcox? Yes. Did you have any communication with Eric Robinson at that point? No, I didn't. You moved on to Nicholas Wilcox? Yes. So Eric went to jail thinking that they were still together. And to me, that changed the dynamic so much mm -hmm. because she made it appear as though they had broken up and then she moved on to Nick later. But actually, as soon as Eric was out of the picture, she and Nick got together. And I can imagine Eric would be really surprised when he gets out of jail and so much had changed in such a short amount of time. In his home. In his home that he's allowing other people to stay in. I mean, granted, they weren't paying the rent, but I always like to be fair and think about both sides. So I was thinking that maybe in Isabella's mind, she and Eric had broken up since their last big fight happened and then their straining order. Right. But remember how we mentioned truths? Subjectively, Isabella's truth was that she wasn't in a relationship with Eric when he left for jail. But objectively speaking, they had not formally ended it. Okay, so now the prosecutor is going to ask Isabella about October 5th when Nick was murdered. Let's listen to what happened in Isabella's own words. Drawing your attention to October of that year, uh, did you personally have any knowledge of when Eric Robinson was supposed to get out of jail? No. Drawing your attention to October 5th of that year, do you remember that date? Yes, I do. The morning of that date? I do. The morning of October 5th, were you sleeping in the same bed as Nicholas Wilcox? Yes, we were. Uh, what if anything awoke you? What woke me up? Yeah. I woke up with Eric holding my mouth and my neck. And then I opened my eyes. The television was still on, and the, th the lights were on. Okay. You saw Eric on top of you, or was he on top of somebody else? He was on top of me. Okay. Tell me what else did you hear or see? Well, at that moment, uh, Eric made a question, not asking if I want to live or die, and also telling me to be quiet, continue holding. I couldn't turn my head to any side. And I could hear Nicholas 
Wilcox struggling to breathe. What do you mean by that? Was a noise that will never leave my mind. Forever horrible old person struggling. I couldn't see him, but I w he was struggling. Terrible noise, like uh, <laughs> a noise like this. Despite hearing those noises that she professed to never forget, she testified that she wasn't aware at the moment that Nick was hurt. How can that possibly be? Right? No. And later she would testify that she did see blood on Nick's face. My question is, and again, I'm never trying to make light of it or be funny about this, but how does someone sleep through someone right next to them being bludgeoned bad enough where they're choking on their own teeth and they're gasping for breath? Right. I do not understand what kind of mattress would allow someone not to feel any motion on their side of the bed. And I know there are types that have the tooth, but this was a normal, what do you call those? Foam. This was a normal foam mattress. You're going to see it in a second to everyone watching. Clearly at that point, Nick couldn't move or he would have gotten up. Eric was on top of Isabella, so no one was holding Nick down. He was in that bad of shape already. So how did she not hear or feel that? Here's what she actually said. Um, in my mind, I thought that, that Nick was gagged or I didn't know he was hurt. Then Eric walked me out of the bed until out around the bed, I couldn't see Nick. At a glimpse of my eyes, I saw some thing on his face that looked like a blood and Eric took me to the living room that was in front of our bedroom, sat me down and he was telling me that he was still not sure if he was going to kill me too, asking uh, why I cheated on him and stayed with Nicholas Wilcox, and we could still listen Nicholas trying to breathe, and he said that he had to finish his job. Despite Isabella saying that Eric told her he wasn't sure if he was going to kill her or not, she stayed on the floor where he told her to wait for him. She watched him walk back into the bedroom with that crowbar. In portions of her testimony, she denied witnessing the attack, but a few minutes later she would contradict herself and say that she did see Eric using the crowbar to smash into Nick's head while screaming, Die motherfucker, die motherfucker. I'll let you hear it for yourself. Now, did you ever see him re-enter the bedroom? Eric? Yes. Yes, I was sitting right in, in at the door, and he he went back. He, what, did you see what he did? Yes. Can you tell the jury what you saw? He had a big piece of of um, a metal, dark metal, like a, I didn't know the name before, but it was a big metal and he was he, he was doing like hitting him several times and saying die motherfucker die motherfucker now you might think that this is where isabella gets up and runs out the door or calls for help as she done in the past through domestic altercations with eric but you would be wrong she was allegedly frozen in a state of shock as she continued listening to eric kill her fiance. According to Isabella's testimony, she sat on the floor submissively, convinced she was going to be Eric's next victim. Isabella told the jury that while Eric was still attacking Nick, he was also maintaining a conversation with her. While actively murdering Nick, Eric was allegedly concerned for Isabella's mental health. More specifically, he thought that maybe she was going to have a panic attack witnessing everything that she'd seen. So Eric knew that Isabella had anxiety and she had been prescribed Xanax. And she would usually take about two milligrams so she could sleep at night. Maybe that could be why she was sleeping Possibly. through the attack. I don't know. But according to Isabella, Eric allegedly asked her where she kept her prescriptions for anxiety and depression. She never mentioned any of this during 
any of her five interviews. But on the stand, now she remembered that Eric had forced her to take four Xanax, which were four times her normal dosage. And he wanted her to take them with vodka to help her calm down. This also allegedly helped Eric to control Isabella for the rest of the 10-hour ordeal. Even though investigators found a text from Isabella to Eric that said, I need a drink. I also want to point out, she had combined Xanax and alcohol before, and it definitely didn't make her calm. It had the opposite effect. Not to mention, there were receipts from a stop at Walgreens where she picked up even more Xanax sometime throughout the day wow. alone. What happens next? He continued talking to me, making questions. He told me, where is your medications for anxiety and depression? I said, it's inside the bedroom in the same drawer. So he told me, he got, gave me, told me to take four bars and then have some some vodka so I could calm down and probably he could take control of my actions after that. Wow. Now remember how Isabella said she never touched Nick's body, that she only helped clean up the scene? Well, during her testimony, she explained that once Nick was dead, Eric began the process of disposing his body. Since Nick was a roofing contractor, he was using an extra room in the house to source some of his construction materials, and that included large tarps he used on top of the homes due to the hurricanes. Isabella was light on the details surrounding how Nick became wrapped up in the tarp. She said the lapse in her memory was due to blackout she suffered due to the trauma she experienced listening to Nick die. She only knows that Eric pulled out one of those tarps to wrap Nick in. Despite her convenient blackout, she testified that she knew for certain that she didn't touch the body or help Eric wrap the body. However, she knew detailed information about how the body was wrapped, including the two belts used to secure the tarp at both ends. Maybe it's because she sat there that whole time that they drove around with the body in the back of Nick's truck. When Isabella was first interviewed by police, they convinced her to talk by telling her that they found Nick. She then asked the police if Nick was still alive, despite knowing definitively that he was dead because she knew that he was wrapped up in that tarp. Right. How is somebody alive and also wrapped up like that, unable to breathe? Doesn't make sense. It doesn't. So let's listen to her explain that. To your knowledge, when he was beating the decedent, Nicholas Wilcox, Nicholas Wilcox was still on the bed, correct? Yes, he was sleeping before. Mm -hmm. How did Nicholas Wilcox, the decedent, uh, get off the bed and into the tarp? I didn't see that happening. And because of all the trauma, there are moments that is some blacking my mind. But I, I believe he just put him next to the tarp in the floor and took it off. Do you think you helped him? To put the body in the tarp? No, I didn't touch the body. Okay. And do you remember how the tarp was wrapped? Yes, I do. Tell us. He, he wrapped it like a burrito and he put two belts. One around the, the neck and one around the, the, the foot, the feet. I remember one of the belts, Eric mentioning, oh, the motherfucker was using my belt. The other, I don't know. Once Nick's body was wrapped like a burrito, her words, which sounded really insensitive, but I guess if that's what it looked like, maybe she was just being accurate. There was still a mess left behind all over the walls, the bed, and the ceiling. Blood all over. And Isabella said Eric demanded that she clean all of it up. She couldn't leave his side, according to her version of events, because she was too scared. Did you have your cell phone on you? At that moment, no. Did you have a cell phone in the house? Yes, I did. Did you call the police? No, I didn't. Why not? I was too scared. Um, as he's doing this, where are you in the apartment? 
next to him. I could never leave his side. That was his <clears throat> mandatory order to stay next to him. And Ms. Tagarini, inside the bedroom where, <coughs> where uh, Nicholas Wilcox was murdered, <laughs> was there any blood in that bedroom? There was a lot of blood. Where? In the bed, in the walls, in the roof. Specifically talking about on the roof, what kind of, what kind of blood was Black there? Black splatters. Okay. At any point did uh, the defendant there, Robinson, say anything about that? <coughs> Later in the day, he wanted to clean and wanted to clean all that. Recall that his home has a back door that leads out to the pool area. And you heard about how Eric's neighbor, Christina Ginsburg, testified that she heard and saw Nick's truck being pulled up to the back gate around 4 a.m. Well, Isabella explained that's the route that Eric took to get Nick's body into the truck. However, she once again contradicts herself in the worst way possible about not having touched Nick's body. Maybe she doesn't consider helping Eric move Nick's body across the grass is touching it, but I think we'd all beg to differ. Absolutely. Now, at one point, the body is wrapped, like you said, as a burrito inside the tarp, correct? Correct. Uh, what happens next? Then he had to drag the body outside. He dragged the body from the living room, from the bedroom to the living room, opening the door to go to the the pool, there was the grass, and he asked in one moment for me to help him because I believe it was stuck, was too heavy. He even said that. The body? Yes. And he finished going to the direction of the gate. There was a gate in the back, and he put the body there. Now, you mentioned the gate. Where is the truck at this point? I saw the truck was back in... The truck was fa was in in the gate. The, the gate was open and he... And the, and the truck was inside, but not completely. Who just put, part. Who put the truck there? Eric. Nick Wilcox was 189 pounds at the time of his death and 5 foot 9. Despite her blackouts and the anxiety meds and vodka used to control her, she was able to help Eric drag and lift the body when it got too heavy for him. Isabella testified that there was a time when she was alone in the house while he was finishing up moving evidence into the truck, but again, never tried to escape or ask for help. Later, cell phone experts will testify and surveillance evidence will be shown that proves that there were numerous opportunities for Isabella to escape and call for help. She insisted that she was too scared to disobey Eric and was in ongoing fear for her life, which could very well be the case. We've never, I mean, I've never been in that situation. Many of us have never, hopefully never in that situation. So it's really hard for us to judge. But at some point, Isabella did get a hold of her phone, but she was still too afraid to call the authorities because she said she didn't trust the police at that time. Now, as much as we, like the jury, may not like Isabella, distrust for the police is a real thing. Many people, especially women who have been victims of domestic altercations and haven't been taken seriously, I'm not saying that's what's happening here with Isabella, but it does happen. And remember, the jury doesn't know any of that. Even the neighbor, Christina Ginsburg, wasn't allowed to bring up the times that she'd actually witnessed Eric assaulting Isabella or the fact that she knew there was that restraining order against Eric at the time. None of that came in as evidence. Initially, when Christina Ginsburg heard Nick's truck take off around 4 a.m., Eric left Isabella all alone to look for a good dumping spot for Nick's body. He actually drove out to Nick's workplace at Synergy and considered dumping it there. But while he was gone and Isabella claimed she didn't have her phone, texts were found between the two of them. Eric had texted her suggesting the Synergy dumping spot and Isabella told him she didn't think it was a good place because he may be found too soon. Wow. 
and Isabella was surprised when she was confronted with that evidence of that text. She said she was only giving suggestions because she was going along with Eric's plan to make it look like Nick left town, and she didn't want it to come back on her if it ended up being a bad spot. The prosecutor is right. The jury probably did not like Isabella. She seems a little too helpful. But maybe she was scared. Maybe she thought she would be implicated, and that was the reason why she wanted Nick to be hidden. Eric didn't find a good spot, so he drove back to his house. Now it's around the time when Eric's ex fiance Meredith, saw Eric come back into her apartment saying that he had just taken the car to the gas station. The fact that Eric didn't drive his Cadillac over to his former house, but took her Kia was a crucial piece of evidence in the state's argument. This was to prove that Eric was attempting to sneak over there unnoticed because his neighbors and even Isabella knew what kind of car he drove. Furthermore, his car was newer and it had GPS on it, and he purposely left his phone behind that also had GPS on it. So he leaves the phone with GPS behind and the car with GPS behind, and they're looking at this as an alibi that he never left. This fact went to the state's assertion that if Isabella had asked Eric for help, he wouldn't need to conceal his identity by taking another vehicle. However, the same argument could be made by the defense. Whether Eric was hiding from Isabella and the neighbors or just the neighbors, he would want it to appear as though he never left his ex's house. So it goes both ways. Because let's say he was merely sneaking over there to see whether Isabella was indeed in bed with Nick. Then he wouldn't want Isabella to recognize the car, even though all the windows were boarded up. It can be argued he was just trying to stay incognito to spy and not necessarily to go kill anyone. But then when he saw them together, all hell broke loose. Once the body was in Nick's truck, Eric told Isabella that he had to go back to a friend's house to exchange cars. He was calling this friend Chris, but we know it's really his ex's apartment. And interestingly, we found out that Isabella was equally as jealous. So it stands to reason Eric didn't want to reveal that he'd been over his ex-fiance's house, especially if he was hoping Isabella would cover for him for killing Nick. Right. I think that this is a huge clue that points to this being Eric who's the one that needs more protection than Isabella. When Eric was gone, he asked Isabella to put all Nick's belongings into garbage bags so it looked like he left town, and then she needed to clean up the mess. Eric was gone for an hour, and I know you're probably sick of me pointing out the obvious, but again, Isabella had the opportunity to do the right thing and call the cops, but instead, she just did as he instructed, even found her cell phone in the bedroom, but still didn't call 911. And then shockingly, when he gets back, Eric wants to have sex with her. And according to her, it was to confirm that they were back together as a couple and to prove that she was going to cooperate. I guess that being in jail for two months and then killing someone really put Eric in the mood, which is disgusting. Right. But phone records show Isabella was texting Eric during this whole time with things like, come home, and saying things like, are you still in love with me? Am I your wife? She even proposed to him at one point, asking if he was going to marry her. Wow. And she tells the investigators and the jury that this was because she wanted him to believe that she really wanted to be with him. But it seems like marriage is really important to her, considering she also wanted Nick to marry her just days before this. And I wonder what the rush was. Hmm. So she texts Eric that she's going to take a shower. And that's when he asked her to put on some sexy lingerie. The investigators did find Eric's semen in Nick's bed, in the second bedroom. That's probably where they had sex instead of the bloody mattress in the main room, which would have been really disgusting. This whole thing is disgusting to me that she would be able to do that. Well, both of them, right? Both of them. But I'm saying have sex with someone that you knew just killed someone regardless. Right. I feel like he did it on Nick's bed for like a payback. They might have. I mean, we don't know that. Right. But here's Isabella's explanation about all those messages. So let's hear it in her own words. When he came back, what happened? Um, he asked me to, to wear some lingeries and be sexy. He wanted to have sex with me. Did you? I did to survive. This was right after he came back, correct? Right after he came back. 
what happened afterwards? We change it. And that's, a lo uh, that's where, because looking now, I know a lot of things, they still are so blurry in my mind. Believe it because of home education, all trauma, seeing my fiance being killed there. But I know that we went out from the house. He, he said he needed to go to the courthouse. Eric didn't want to miss his probation appointment that morning, but apparently he didn't want to drive. So he had Isabella drive his Cadillac to the courthouse and drop him off. At this point, she was waiting for him at Publix. Remember that? We showed you that video of her just strolling the aisles before they had that embrace in front of the camera. It's surprising that he would have someone under the influence of Xanax and alcohol exactly. driving his car. And when the CCTV footage from the Publix parking garage is pulled up, Isabella has no problem maneuvering her car around sharp turns, despite her convenient blackouts. Right, she could operate heavy machinery. Just fine, and remembered promising that she would obey Eric and not try to escape. When they were leaving the landfill, Eric actually asked an employee for directions to Naples. Okay, go to Naples. Yeah, you take this right but once they drove off, Isabella said that at Eric's request, she Googled directions to the Everglades. Now, I told you what the Everglades was like in the beginning of this video. It's actually pretty well known as a dumping ground for dead bodies, among a lot of other things, especially because it's infested with alligators that can make a body disappear in one gulp. They drove quite a while towards the Everglades looking for the right place, but apparently Eric thought it was again too busy, so they turned back and headed home. They go to all those places just to come back to Plantation and put Nick's body in the Publix dumpster, just a few minutes away from their house, where there are a bunch of cameras. As a matter of fact, the investigators pulled that CCTV footage, and although there wasn't a camera directly next to the dumpster that they chose, there was one camera that captured Nick's truck. We're playing that footage now for anyone watching. It's not the best quality, but there you can see Eric and Isabella in Nick's truck backing it up to the dumpster. A little after noon on October 5th. Eric gets out and throws Nick's body into the dumpster. After throwing away Nick's body like trash, they drive back home. Isabella explained that they acted like a normal couple. Eric took off all his clothes, then laid down on the couch, which she referred to as his favorite thing to do, and rested while Isabella made him a late breakfast. Can you even imagine? That's the normal thing you do after you kill your ex fiance right? Yeah, as one does after disposing of their former lover's body in a dumpster. Yikes, how do you even have an appetite after that? He asked me to Google my cell phone, Everglades. Okay. Did you? I did. And? And we followed what I was saying there, and he drove for a long time. It was raining too much. There were places with small rivers or some kind of lakes. Okay. He stopped in some of them to look if it was a good place for him to throw the body there. To what? To throw, to put the body there, to throw the body. Okay. Dispose, I don't know. And, but he didn't find any, any place. No, no place was good enough. No, no place was good for him. So after driving for a while, we drove even raining, he decided to turn back and go back towards the our our place, plantation. Plantation. Mm -hmm. When you got close to plantation, did did you stop anywhere? Uh, did you get rid of the body anywhere? Yeah. Yes. Where? Um, behind the Publix. Now, Ms. Tagarini, you mentioned that. Mr. Robinson wanted to get rid of the body as a dump, correct? Yes. And you drove all the way to the Everglades, correct? Yes. Why would you go back to plantation and dump the body there, if you know? I believe because he couldn't find a place that where there was nobody in the Everglades it was day already. People could see him. How close to your house was the body disposed of? I know that place because I leave it around there, so I believe around 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And now it's time for a little DIY. They went with the divide and conquer method. 
Isabella would clean the walls while Eric began tearing apart that mattress we talked about, the bloody mattress, removing the portions of it that were soaked with Nick's blood and putting them in garbage bags. That way he could easily dispose of such a large item without anyone noticing a crime was committed on it. Eric made several trips to the Deloro apartment complex, which was about a block away. He originally wanted to throw Nick's body in there, but he decided against it since there were so many residents that used those dumpsters. Here's a picture of what investigators found inside those garbage bags, torn up pieces of the mattress soaked in dried blood. It actually looks black when it's fully dried. I know people don't usually see it this way, but they also found the mattress leaning right up near the dumpster. In between painting the walls and Eric disposing of the mattress, the two of them were texting each other, professing their love. I guess nothing brings two people closer than a break-in and a murder. You were texting with Eric Robinson using Messenger, correct? Correct. What kind of things were you texting with? During the day? Yeah, that day. Yes. When he was gone? When he was gone, I was texting him about my feelings. I was asking him if he was if he was still in love with me, if he was going to marry me, because I, I, I never knew what time he was going to come back or if he was outside. I had to make sure that I was so, so scared and so afraid that I had to make sure that he was not going to kill me, like he said. You asked him to marry you? I said yes, if he was going to marry me. And later, around 4 p.m., Isabella and Eric head over to the Home Depot to pick up a can of white paint because no amount of scrubbing with hydrogen peroxide would remove the dark blood stains. They went back home and Isabella painted the walls and the ceiling. This is when she finally called her ex-husband and revealed what happened. And we know the rest. Now, this whole time, you've been hearing from the prosecution questioning Isabella. But once she's on cross-examination by the defense, she continued to contradict herself quite a bit. And she explained those contradictions with memory loss and paralyzing fear. That's a pretty hard story to swallow with all of the evidence. She had a little more difficulty explaining away that marriage contract between herself and Nick, which was written just 10 days after her boyfriend went to prison. Here's that interaction now. Eric Robinson went to jail on, on August 23rd, 2017, correct? Correct. And you said that it took about three weeks for you and Nick Wilcox to uh, get into a relationship, right? Yes. Okay. Do you recall that you and Nicholas Wilcox drew up a marriage contract? We never drew a marriage contract. We wrote a love letter together. Actually, he wrote it. It's his handwriting. Okay. So he wrote up a document, right? You're, you're saying it's not a contract, um, but it was him promising to marry you. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. um, promising that you two would have children. Yes. That he would make you happy every day of your life except for 10% and that he would give 90% that you're right. Yes. Okay. And you and Nicholas signed, or Nick, you and Nick signed this document and, mm -hmm. both, and both put your blood on it to seal it. Yes. Right? Um, do you remember the date that you drew up that document? No, I don't. Right, you don't recall. With me showing it to you, refresh your recollection. Yes, you can show me. Can you show kind of the What is the date on the bottom of that document? September 3rd. 2017, right? 2017. Okay, so if Eric Robinson, I'm no math scholar, but if Eric Robinson went to jail on August 23rd, this is about 10 days later, right? Almost two weeks, yes. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. But you testified on direct that you and Nick Wilcox didn't even get into a relationship until three weeks after Eric went to jail, right? That's what I believe was all that time, but okay. that does make a big difference was after. Okay. In fact, you and Nick Wilcox actually became romantically involved immediately after Eric went to jail, correct? Not immediately. We were really friends, but not immediately. So I'm sure you remember this marriage contract. You just heard about it now. She kept referring to it as a love letter. It was signed and dated by both Isabella and Nick and sealed with their blood. And I have a picture of it. It read, quote, I will marry Isabella Taglarini on October 14th, 2017. Nicholas Wilcox will take her hand in marriage that day, and I will support her and have a child that bears my name. I promise to make her happy every day of her life except 10%, and I will give 90% that she's right. I will never ever cheat on her for the rest of my life, end quote. Ironically, Isabella wouldn't be wearing a white dress on October 14th. Instead, she was wearing two metal bracelets and being put behind bars on her would-be wedding day. The defense suggested that Isabella was out for herself. Her number one priority was self-preservation, and any man who could provide that security would do just fine. She didn't care if it was to Eric or Nick. It didn't matter which man married her, because what Isabella really wanted was American citizenship, and that would only come with the marriage to another American citizen. The defense alleged that part of her plan was fluid. This is why, on the day of the murder, she texted Eric asking if he really promised to marry her in exchange for her help. That's because the man who had previously sworn a blood oath to marry four weeks earlier was dead. The defense attorney also implied that was the real reason why Isabella never tried to escape, and why she initially denied that Eric had murdered Nick. The defense was hoping for an opening in her testimony where they could introduce their theory that it was Isabella who had murdered Nick, and it was Eric who had offered to help with the cleanup. The only problem with that theory was that the evidence never showed Isabella connecting with Eric and asking for his help. The medical examiner also described Nick's injuries as requiring a significant level of force that Isabella was unlikely to have been able to inflict. The DNA evidence from the crime scene wasn't sufficient to prove Eric ever laid hands on Nick, which makes sense since he was allegedly wearing gloves. However, there was DNA evidence. Nick's blood was found on the outside of the yellow gloves used to clean up. Both Isabella and Eric's DNA were found on the inside of those gloves. Wow, that's a lot because it shows they're cleaning because it's like his blood on the outside and then their hands were both inside the gloves. Yeah. The cell phone data came into play as well in this case since there was no direct communication shown from Isabella to Eric that could tie her to requesting his help in the middle of the night. So the judge denied the request to introduce an alternative suspect theory and placed the blame on Isabella. This significantly tied the defense's hands. However, it was pointed out the not all electronic devices had been analyzed. For example, another phone was found at the scene. It wasn't the one that Isabella owned or Nick or Eric, and it was not investigated. It could have very well been a burner phone or one that only used Wi-Fi. Not to mention, Isabella's iPad was never collected and analyzed, and neither were the two desktop computers that were in the home. The defense tried to suggest that there were other ways that Isabella could have communicated with Eric. But the prosecution pointed out that everything lived in the cloud. If they had used other devices, those messages would show up on their phones. Because Eric only had his phone. Remember? He only had his phone because he was at his ex fiance's house. So even if Isabella had used a different device at the house, she still would have had to send it to Eric's phone for him to get that message. However, there were texts discovered between Isabella and Nick on October 3rd where she's telling him he's a liar, that he's not who she thought he was. And that was the same day that Eric got out of jail. And the defense found it hard to believe that Isabella wouldn't have noticed that that love letter or marriage contract had been taken from the wall since it had been there for quite some time, taped on her side. She wouldn't notice those things. Right, you would. And she wouldn't notice that Eric's car was gone from the front of the driveway. That had to have been obvious to both Isabella and Nick when they got home from work that day. The defense attorney made sure to question Isabella about the fact that she and Eric shared a bank account and she could see Eric's car payments coming out automatically and that he owned that vehicle. So she couldn't say, oh, I thought 
that it got towed away. But her answers were very vague. Could she have realized Eric was back and she was going to get caught cheating? I thought about that. Right? So she made up a story to enlist Eric's help. She said he broke in through the back door. But unfortunately, there were no fingerprints ever lifted to be analyzed from that area. I guess it wouldn't matter since he was wearing gloves. But could Isabella have opened the door to let Eric inside? These are questions that a lot of people had. Yeah, that doesn't seem likely, but I suppose everything's possible. In closing arguments, the prosecutor reminded the jury what he told them in the opening statements, that they likely wouldn't like Isabella, that out of self-interest and a desire to avoid jail, she repeatedly lied to them, but it was in her best interest now to tell the truth, and the evidence backed up her story. He told the jury that the cell phone data backed up her story, and the evidence showed that Eric Robinson, in a jealous rage, broke into the home he once shared with Isabella and Nick, and he had murdered him. He told the jury that if not for Isabella's fast thinking and willingness to play along with Eric's fantasies of reconciliation, she would have likely been dead too. Isabella had agreed to tell people that Nick had left her and she was going to use his cell phone to keep exchanging messages back and forth that would make this story plausible. There was cell phone evidence proving that Eric did go over to the house on October 3rd when he got out of jail, while both Nick and Isabella's phones were pinging in West Palm. The prosecutor told the jury that when he saw the marriage contract, it confirmed Isabella had cheated on him with his friend Nick. The evidence showed that Eric Robinson was responsible for the murder of Nicholas Wilcox. He had the motive, the means, and the opportunity. The defense's closing statements were brief. Rachel told the jury that Isabella had an equal, if not greater, motive to kill Nick. The new couple had a documented history of relationship issues, including the time that Nick recently threw Isabella out of the house and made her stay at a hotel. They didn't think the prosecution had met their burden beyond a reasonable doubt. But in the end, the jury disagreed. They found Eric Robinson guilty of the second-degree murder of Nicholas Wilcox, what do you think? Do you think they got it right? Please leave it in the comments. I was waiting to read everyone's opinions. At the sentencing, Nick's brother Don gave a moving victim impact statement. Let's listen to that now. You took my brother away from me. My only brother. You have your sister up there. How would you feel if you, someone took her away from you? My brother has three kids. He's got a little girl. All of them, he has two boys as well. None of them have a father now. Why? Then, in closing... Don read a letter from his father who couldn't bear to be present. And I really wanted you to listen to this. It was so emotional. To the court will be renending this punishment. This is the most difficult thing my wife and I have ever dealt with in our lives. This senseless tragedy has left a wound so deep it will never heal. Every day we are haunted by the events that took place on that dark day of October 5th, 2017. I'll never forget the night that our eldest son, Don, called and said Nicholas was murdered. I felt as if a lightning bolt had struck me. My first thought was that information was incorrect. I did not want to believe his words. I was paralyzed. It took what seemed like forever to respond. Then all I could think of was how I was going to break the news to my wife. When I did, all we could do was hold each other so tight and just cry. That same night, Norch, Connecticut Police Department and chaplain came to our house and confirmed that Nicholas was dead, that he'd been killed. The delivery of their word brought us to our needs. This took away all hope that this was a mistake. Through our agony and grief, Neither one of us could hear the words the chaplain was saying. There were no words that could be said to comfort us. We were in Connecticut and our younger son's body lay in a morgue in Florida. My wife and I were so distraught we could barely move. Our son Don, who lives in Florida, took over for us. He had to identify the, brother, the body of his brother, make funeral arrangements and cremation arrangements, and then bring his brother's ashes to us in Connecticut. He had to endure the gruesome sight of his brother's murdered body all alone. He shielded my wife and I as to the glory of the gory details of this murder. To this day and forevermore, my eldest son will carry this burden and forever remember the unimaginable images of his dead brother. I will forever hear the words from him, Dad, you do not need to know everything that occurred. If you were to hear it, it would destroy your mom. To you, Eric Robinson, who demonstrated yourself to be nothing more than an animal, a coward who murdered my son in the most brutal and vicious ways while he was asleep in his bed and then dumped his body in the trash you have taken away all that my son had and ever will have. I watched the trial and learned more than I wanted to know regarding what happened to my son, Nicholas. The prosecutor displayed the evidence with an accurate narrative of the murder. I was truly not prepared to hear this. I was totally devastated. My eldest son was right when he asked how much I really wanted to know. My wife, son, and I 
all suffer with days of depression when we completely shut down. Eric Robinson has a history of violence, has never shown any remorse for the crimes he's committed. While I was watching the trial, it was evident by his facial expressions, overall demeanor, that he showed no remorse for what he did. He is truly a violent animal who should never be let back into society again. I ask you, Judge, what sentence would you bestow upon the person who murdered your son by bludgeoning and stabbing him while he slept in his bed and then dumping his dead body in the trash? I trust you would want justice, the most severe punishment carried out by his murderer. At first, I wanted Eric Robinson to receive the death penalty. However, given more thought, I wish him to receive life imprisonment with no chance for parole. Then each day he survives, he will know he will never have freedom. He will never have a wife or children. He will always be looking over his shoulder in prison. I pray each day he wakes up to be reminded of what he did and never be able to wash the blood of my son off his hands. Eric Robinson, the coward that he is, will be forever haunted by his prison life, knowing the only way out is death. In summary, Eric Robinson has caused this family an insurmountable amount of pain and grief by the murder of Nicholas that will never be healed. My parents will never see their son again. They will forever be haunted by his murder. They suffer daily with a diminished and destroyed quality of life due to the senseless murder of their son. They will never see their son fully develop into a man, father, and husband. I will never see my brother again. I will never be able to talk to him, call him, see him. For the rest of my life, I will have nightmares and the haunting by the sight of my brother's dead body and visualize how he died and what you did to him. His children will grow up without a father and live in a hole in their hearts that will never close. They will never be with their father for birthdays, Christmases, weddings, or births of their own children. His grandchildren will never know their grandfather. No parent should ever have to endure the murder of their child. The impact of this affects many more than just the victim. It affects everyone that is connected to the victim in much deeper ways that can be expressed here in words. Wow. I, again, cannot possibly imagine the pain that Nick's poor family has gone through. And no matter who orchestrated this entire murder, it was brutal and it's devastating that Nick is gone. And they have to live with that for the rest of their lives. Eric Robinson was sentenced to life in prison without parole, plus two five-year sentences to run concurrently. Eric has filed a notice of appeal in his case against the state of Florida. Now, don't they all do that? Yeah, and we'll have to see what happens with that. And Isabella will be on probation until 2026. And we really want your thoughts on this one. We really do. It was a very complicated case, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's obvious. I feel Isabella has something to do with it. But I do still struggle with what I believe is the truth because I go back and forth. Yeah. Because I can see both. I can see. But in the end, I do believe Isabella should have been doing some time. Oh, absolutely. Because she contradicted herself and said, oh, no, I moved his body. That automatically makes it from tampering with evidence to back to accessory after the fact. Right. And you know that this man, Eric, is only in jail for so long, and yet you you shack up with your roommate in the same bed? Like, what are you thinking? That's just my thought. I don't I know. I don't think she was thinking. Maybe she thought he would go to jail for five years, or yeah. she was caught up in the romance. Right, She's totally. caught up in the feelings. But I think it is plausible that she saw the car. She was like, oh my gosh, he's back. Right. But she could have quickly just cleaned up and been like, we have to tell him a different way. Sure. Knowing and then one, that. And then one night he came back and caught them. <sighs> yeah. It's just terrible. It's terrible any it way you look at it. But we thank all of you for being here for yet another one of our videos. We yeah, thank you thank so you. very much. Thank you for subscribing. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Click the notification bell so you don't miss out on our next upload. Because we don't know if we're going to post on a Monday. Or a Tuesday or whatever day. <laughs> Someday. But we know we will. So be here. Oh.